following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let Yehida be lights in the firmament. As you see, instead of Yehi, we pronounce Yehida, since Yehi, as we were explaining, is just an abbreviation that relates to the word of Yehida, which encompasses the light of the Logos, the light of God, represented by the three sephiroths, Keter, Chokmah, Binah, which in Christianity are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Plus, the noble divine, which in Kabbalah is called the Ein Sof, the limitless, the limitless light. So, the noble or manifested light with the light of the Logos form the famous Tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God, yod Hey vav Hey, which is that unity <coughs> represented by the word Yehida, which means unity in Hebrew. So, this lecture follows, of course, the third day of Genesis. And please pay attention, you know, and to understand uh, in which way this uh, fourth day that we enter in develops cosmically macrocosmically and microcosmically because as above so below and as below so above so when you read uh, let yehi Yehida, be lights in the firmament of heaven. We understand then that the world or the light of Yehida will become another light, which by the term lights, which is plural, that in Hebrew is called Meorot means, of course, more than one. 
in reality, Merot means two, two lights. But usually, people always point as the moon and the sun. But in this lecture, we are going to explain in which way this moon and the sun relate, of course, with this secondary light that emerges from Yehida, which is Yehi in Hebrew. Many times we explain that uh, from the world, the Logos, which is Yehida, and that is also called the world of Atziluth, emanates this second light, which is called Haya, or Hai, which means life. Of course, Haya, life, just by the way that is written, represents the duality. Haya is written with Het and Yod. And uh, as we explain in many lectures, the letter Yod, which is just an spat, or the first struck, when you make any letter in Hebrew, that spat, that yod, relates to the light of Yehida. That light, which is diluted in the abstract, absolute space, And uh, the letter Het, or the word Hai, life, is formed by the letter Vav and by the letter Zain, which in Kabbalah represents Adam and Eve. Or we want to point heavens, we will say Abba and Ima, father and mother. This father and mother, Ava and Ima, represented by the letter Het, are the secondary light of the Yad, forming that second type of light or type of consciousness that we call Haya. And this is something that we have to understand because life and light is the same thing. So, Haya is like a temple that receives that light. In Hinduism, this duality is called Shiva Shakti. And indeed, receives many names and different religions. So this Haya, which is life, <coughs> is that uh, soul or consciousness related with the third Sephira of the tree of life, which is called Bina. Let us go down into the graphics that we have in this PDF and look at the tree of life. In this uh, graphic of the tree of life, we see two tree of lives. One in which we find the man behind the tree of life and the other in which we rot the four worlds of Kabbalah. From the bottom, Asia, then Yetzirah, Bria and Atziluth, which is that world that together with the Ein Sof is forming what we call Yehida, that unity. 
which is diluted in the seventh dimension. The seventh dimension of the universe. This is how we have to understand it, as you see here in the, in the graphic. We also call it the zero dimension. This light of Yehira divides itself here, as you see, in the third sephira called Bina. Ava and Ima. <coughs> and from that descend into that. And they contain. Ava and Ima contain, as you see, in the way that is written, Hai, which is life, contain the Yod, which represents the upper light. So when we talk about life, we are talking about this light also, but it's hidden within life. A type of light that you cannot see with your physical sight. You need a spiritual sight a samadhi, an ecstasy, a rapture in the world of spirit in order to see that light. <coughs> but here, of course, through the lecture, intellectually, we have to understand that light, that light called Yehida is a source of all lights. That's why when we refer to Keter, which is that spot that appears from the unknowable divine into the universe, that keter, that crown, is called the father of all lights. And as we explain in all the lectures, he represents the 13 sephiroth, three unknowable and 10 noble which made the 13 attributes of mercy, which represents the hair of the Ancient of Days that abides in the world of God, in the world of the Logos. And he is, Keter, what we call Eheye Ashe Eheye. which translated into English means, I become who becomes. It's an eternal becoming of that light. Certain Kabbalists call it the world to come. But when we say the world to come, intellect tells us, oh, it's a world that is going to be in the future. So it's a wrong translation. It's not the word to come, it's the word of becoming because it's eternal. It's always flowing. That light is always flowing in the universe. It's related with the space. When you see, for instance, the stars in the night, you see spots of lights everywhere in the darkness of the space. And you might think uh, space is dark. But in the reality it's not dark. It's dark for us. Because we, don't, we cannot see the powerful light that is shining in the space. What we see is just the secondary light which are those stars, suns, moons, planets that shine within that light. Because with, with, without that light, any sun can have, cannot have that light, cannot shine. Imagine that space that is dark for us, but that is light for those beings that are very purified, called Paramartha Satyas. Like a mass ocean 
of life. That's why we said in other lectures that the dark space is related with that which in Sanskrit is called Akash. Which is a dark, dark blue substance diluted in the space. If you think that the space that you see in the night is empty, you're wrong. The type of light that for us is darkness. Beyond our comprehension. And in that light is where all the planets, galaxies, the infinite is floating. Including our planet Earth. As when we go into the ocean and we see fish and many other elements floating above and within the water. <coughs> that is the Akash. That modifies in different dimensions. We were explaining in the previous lecture how that light was becoming dry land. Or matter. We said that that Akash is matter, <coughs> but in cha chaotic manner. The Bible says earth related with matter. And it's reaching in Genesis that that matter, earth, was formless and void. And darkness was upon the face of the abyss. So that matter, formless and void, becomes dry land. That dry land could be any planet in the infinite space. This planet here, we call it Earth. But if we see it really, the continents, which is the dry land, float on the ocean, on the water, even physically. <coughs> so, as we explained in previous lectures, in the previous lecture, from that land, dry land, sprouts, plants, herbs, grass, and it is written there, and Yehi became grass, herbs, plants. It means that that light of Yehida becomes a unity, but a concrete unity. Because Yehida, the light of the Logos, is a unity. But abstract unity, only light. When that light concretes, there is a unity. But in the very depth of that unity is the same light that is given that power to be concrete. A planet, a comet, plant, animal. You know very well that our physical body, for instance, is called organism because it's formed by organs, organs by cells, cells by molecules, molecules by atoms, and with, it, with a synthetic with an atom, we liberate light, energy, fire. So in the end, every unity in the depth is light, fire, energy. Nobody ignores that in this three-dimensional world. So, imagine those planets floating in that tide, that wave, that comes from the zero dimension, or seven dimension, into the sixth, into the fifth, 
into the fourth, into the third. You can, of course, track that wave of light in different ways, vibrations, sound, etc. In this two-dimensional world, the scientists are tracking certain waves that, according to their theories, they said that the universe exploded from the beginning. The famous theory, the Big Bang. And from there, they are tracking that wave. That wave and many other waves are just tied waves from that light that expresses itself not three-dimensionally, but multi-dimensionally. Types of light that like you see, for instance, a tsunami that comes and leaves. But in the universe, those ties of light are so massive that in order to return or have a movement of back and forth in the space, it takes millions of years. So in that wave of light called Yehida is where we find every type of life. Three-dimensional life, tetra-dimensional life, epta-dimensional life, because life exists in all dimensions, not only in this physical world. We can find worlds with other type of life, other type of matter in other dimensions, with other humanities. We are here in the world of Asia, the very bottom of the tree of life, the most gross type of matter. So, as you see, <coughs> every plant, every herb, every tree, transforms the light of Yehida and transmitted it to the space. So in the space you find the suns, planets, that irradiates, that irradiate that type of light that we call aura. In the night when you see in the sky you observe different planets shining with different type of lights, blue, red, yellow, etc. They are just reflecting through the dry land the light of Yehida which is being transformed in them. That's why we find in the graphics, in the second graphic or the third graphic of this PDF, Moses kneeled be before the burning bush, above his burning bush. We saw the angel that, according to the Bible, said that appeared in that burning bush and told Moses, Eheye, Ashe, Eheye, I become who becomes. But it's that light that is talking. And obviously, it's his present to the tree. Because the tree is that uh, plant that transform the light of Christ, now I'm talking in Greek terms, or the light of the Messiah, talking in Hebrew terms, because that soul of the Messiah is precisely within that light of Yehida. That in order to appear in this three-dimensional world or in any dimension, needs the assistance of the light of Haya, of those lights that the fourth day of Genesis says, let Yehida 
become or be lights, two lights in the firmament of heaven. So in other words, Haya, Abba and Ima, father and mother, or in Christian terms, it was said, Joseph and Mary, or uh, Shiva Shakti, appear so that he can manifest come down through them into the universe. So of course, when we talk about Mary and Joseph or Shiva Shakti or many other terms biblically uh, from other Bibles, from other sacred books, we are addressing the way in which that light becomes unity in the human being. But when we address this, that we are talking microcosmically, you have to understand that every single element on the dry land, whether it's a plant, grass, herb, or a tree, which also represents a human being, because we are trees, or any animal, because animal in Hebrew is hayot and has the root in haya. So all of these kingdoms that we call mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and human kingdom express that light. So when you see the light in the sky of the sun, or any star, or any planet, is showing just the light that is transformed through these four kingdoms, according to their own level. So therefore, in the universe, we have three types of suns, S-U-N. And we talk about in previous lectures about it, but we are going to repeat it in order for us to understand. The first sun is what in Kabbalah is called Ein Sof Or, the limitless light, a pure soul, sun, which expresses itself through a second type of sun, which is also pure in their own level. Our sun, that is the center of the solar system, is a secondary type of sun. But behind it is that primer type of sun, which is called Yehida. So when you see the sun, Behind it, in the seventh dimension, is Yehida. And then you see the physical body of that spiritual light that gives life to this planet. But like our sun, there are millions, trillions of suns in the space which are the channel of Yehida. Not only our sun. And uh, there are other type of sun that in this planet are called planets. A planet Earth is a third type of sun, which is in process of perfection of his light. And that's why we see that all these lights that radiate for these three types of suns in the universe adjust the expression of that Yehida in different levels or that unities. And uh, that's why it's written, let that Yehida become lights, plural. 
So the spiritual sun becomes different type of lights that we see in the universe. Through which the light is asking for perfection. That's why this is the light that Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospels address. When he addresses his inner being. His own particular keter. He says, I am the light of the world. Translated Kabbalistically means Yehida or Yeheye. Yehi is the light of the world, which was expressing itself through him, through that human unity that we call Jesus of Nazareth. But not only through him manifest. It manifested through Moses. It's coming into my mind this very moment, and I, I should tell you that, because if I don't say it, I will lose it. In Hebrew, the word uh, light is called aur. Aleph, vav, resh, or. This is for light. But for skin, the skin of your, of your body is also our, or, or, as we say in Hebrew, or. It's a difference. And it's the letter A. Light, or, is written in the beginning with Aleph. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But skin is or written with Ayin, which is another A. But it is 16 letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is very significant that both are A's, but one is light and the other is skin, skin of your body. When Moses descended, seeing that or of the burning bush, it is written in the Bible that his or was shining his skin. Because in reality, any type of skin or any type of concrete matter, dry matter, is a manifestation, the concrete manifestation of that or of that light. And behold, the letter Ajin, the 16 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, means I, E, Y, E, I. Isn't that wonderful? That the I is the organ in the physical body that sees the light in this physical world. And that the head, physically speaking, is a firmament, the heaven, physic physically speaking. And in this heaven, in this head that we have, we have two lights, or we will say two eyes, that reflect the light. Because what we see is the what we get in our eyes is just a reflection. This is our ayin, the way that we see. But these two eyes are physical. We have other two eyes, which are spiritual, related with the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, which is called the ahna chakra and the sahasrara chakra, that allowed us to see yehi. Because with the physical sight, with that ayin, that eye, we see only the physical light. But if you want to see the spiritual light, you have to put in activity your pineal gland, your pituitary gland, and you will see yehi, the divine light. 
which expresses us in different manners and different levels in each one of us. So then, this is a relation, but in order not to lose it. That is the light. And of course, <coughs> through the transformation and the purification of the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and human kingdom of every single planet, that light enters into a process of purification through the elements. And this is precisely the work that we have to do. Now listen. One light represents the night. And the other light represents the day. As the Bible explains it. It says there, Let ye he be lights in the firmament of heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. You know that physically speaking, these lights, whether are the moon, the stars, galaxies, we use it for signs, seasons, and for days and years. But esoterically speaking, for those that are entering into the path, those lights, sun and moon, in your dreams, when you are in the other dimensions, represent, symbolize, sign for seasons, initiations, for days, and for years. We talk about uh, the way in which the Bible talks about the years. We said 100 years, first initiation. 200 years, second initiation. 300 years, third initiation. Now we are entering to the fourth day, 400 years. Esoterically speaking, this is how we count Kabbalistically. Kabbalah is in relation with numbers. So this is the signs for seasons, for days, and for years, that you need to know in order to, when you have an experience, to analyze and to comprehend where I'm going. I'm walking in this path, but how do I know in which level I am? What degree? What initiation? God talks to you through the lights, because He is light. From the light comes the sound, the word. That light is yod he vav he The light is hai. Remember that the first initiations that are represented by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are done through Shaddai el hai. That is translated as the Almighty God. That light, when appearing in front of Moses says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the heir of Jacob. The God of Jacob. Representing, of course, the monad. The three patriarchs. That are in a state of potentiality within each one of us. So then... In the universe, <coughs> you know that there are two terms that we talk in many lectures. The Pralaya and the Mambantara. Or the Maha Pralaya and the Maha Mambantara. We say, the Maha Mambantari, Mantara is the cosmic day. And the Maha Pralaya, the cosmic night. Right? In both sides, the cosmic day and the cosmic night, <coughs> the light expresses itself. What is a cosmic day? Amaha Mambantara. It is the manifestation 
of Yehida through different dimensions. <coughs> From the seventh dimension, crystallizing to the sixth, fifth, fourth, third. That is a cosmic day. It's what we call the rounds. What is a cosmic di night? Is the withdrawing of that light, the returning of that light into the source, which is the Ein Sof, which represent by the letter He. So when that light is withdrawing from the third dimension, from the fourth, from the fifth, from the sixth, to the seventh, returning into the source, which is the Ein Sof, it is diminishing. Represented by the moon. But when it is manifesting and expressing it from above to below, it's called the sun. So any sun in the infinite space, any planet, or I mean, when he said any sun, any type of sun, is the expression of that light, and it's called cosmic day. It's the sun. But the withdrawing of that light, the returning into the source, which is the unknowable divine, is represented by any moon in the infinite space. Any type of moon is losing, little by little, strength. In the beginning, of course, the two lines that we are talking about here which is Haya express the powerful force of Yehida but in the second level they are pure this is what we call Ava and Ima but when those lights start to express themselves in the universe, then Ima becomes diminished, is diminishing. And the Father is increasing in power. In the tree of life, the right column represents the light of the sun that descends with a lot of strength of the ends of R. But remember, that sun, S-U-N, could be our sun or any sun. And also the planet, because it's a third type of sun. And the left column represents the moon. The way in which the light is returning into its own source. And that's why it is written that in the night, the moon is controlling the forces, the light. But in the day, it's the sun. But it's obvious that the sun is po more powerful, stronger than the moon. But we hold here the symbol of this fourth day because it's very profound. And I'm trying here to tell you in a very in the synthesis manner the, the way that we have to understand and to see these two lights. It represents male and female, positive and negative. And in the center of the tree of life, which represents the spinal medulla in us, is a way in which that light should return in us in order to have illumination. In the universe, you find that before the manifestation or the primary light called Yehida, darkness is covering that light. As the Bible says, 
and darkness was upon the face of the absolute. And after that it says, and the Ruach Elohim said, let there be light, which is the first day. But imagine that, put that in your mind and see that before the manifestation of that primary light, which is pure and divine, darkness is covering the space. You don't see the light. And what do you find in the space, the universe? You find moons related with that darkness. Before the manifestation of that sun, solar absolute, moons, because the moons are elements that were active in previous cosmic days. And in order for a moon to withdraw from the scenario of the universe, it does it in steps. It's not like, for instance, this planet Earth is going to become moon in the next cosmic day, and it's going to be like that, slapping on fingers. No, it's a process. Four dimension, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh dimension, returning into their own source. But this planet will become a moon, but right now it's not a moon. So during that process of extracting the light from the dry matter, it's obvious that the moon is controlling in a very lower level the universe. This is why it's written in Kabbalah that uh, before the manifestation of that primary light, darkness was covering that light and is what is called klifa or shell in Kabbalah. But uh, close to that klifa or shell of darkness that was covering the face of the abyss were all the moons, of course that eventually will become cosmic dust. In our solar system, in relation with our own planet Earth, it is written that a moon light that was diminishing little by little was in that space and it was called Lilith. It said that darkness was called night, which in Hebrew is Laila. From that Laila comes the word uh, Dalaila, which is precisely that force, lunar force that uh, was the ruin of Shemshan, Shemesh, the sun. So, listen carefully. The light of the moon, which is withdrawing and entering to the, their own source, is a type of light that is devolving and that is influencing any type of matter in any planet. That's why you find in the universe that there are plants, animals, human beings that are channelers of the solar light. But also you find human beings, animals, plants, minerals that channel the lunar light, which is decreasing. So we have these two types of lights right, in the universe. The solar and the lunar. But from the lunar, on the dark elements, the lunar force is what is called woman, and the solar is what is called man, or Adam, in other words. Adam Chava. So the Zohar talks very extensively about these two lights that we have to understand 
and comprehend. Now, the moon, according to Kabbalah, rules two sephiroth. The sephiroth Yesod and the sephiroth, or the sephiroth, I mean, Hod. Yesod and Hod are ruled by the moon. If we place this sephiroth in our three brains, your sword in the, is in the sex, and hard is in the solar plex. And Netzach, which is the top of that triangle, is in the head. So there you have Hod and Yasod, which relates, of course, to the lower lights in our physicality, ruled by the moon. These two moons are called in Kabbalah Lilith and Nama, or written sometimes Nahema. Lilith and Nama are two aspects of the moon that rules this humanity. The Lita and Naima are related with fornication, adultery, and sexual violence. This humanity devolves in two circles, psychological circles of the Lita and Naima, everybody. We have, of course, to withdraw the light of the moon in a chemical manner through that, the knowledge of transmutation. If we don't do it, then the planet will do it in a mechanical manner. And we won't be conquerors, but failures. That's why, when we talk about transmutation of the sexual energy, we talk about Yesod and Hod, the two moons that relate with our own particular psychology. And these two moons control our psyche and control the planet. But the solar light also is controlling the planet, as you see. But unfortunately, in order for the light of Yehida, which in the tree of life you see, that is reflected by the monad in Tifereth, in order to enter into Malkut, it has forcibly passed through Yesod and through Hod, because come like this, from Tiferet to Netzah, which is the mind, into Hod, which is the emotional center, and to Yesod, which is the sexual center, and finally to shine in our physicality, which is Malkut, the very bottom of the tree of life. What we have to do is to return the light in our sexual transmute through our sexual transmutation and to save the emotional force which is present through hod in our heart and solar plex. If we want to return and to make light in a tsa, <coughs> which is our mind, which relates to the fourth day. Netzach is the mind, is that solar mind that we have to create. Because right now, we have a lunar mind. But behold, and understand and comprehend 
that all the lights that comes from above, from the infinite space, from the galaxies, from the solar system, comes into the planet Earth and is transformed in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, and human kingdom. But in order to transform that in the solar manner, we have to be chased and we have to fight against the moon that decreases. Because normally, the people enter into the world of Klippoth, which is beneath Malkut. In order for that light that we are talking about to be released and to return into its own source. That's why in the times of the end, when a humanity is already mature, start to enter into the infernal worlds called Klippoth. There, the releasing of that light is a process of disintegration of the lunar matter, because this is cosmic law. As the moon decreases little by little and releases that light in different process, we have that moon inside of us, the two moons, called Lilith and Nahema, which are just the protoplasmic bodies that we have, that eventually will release that light in the process of disintegration of the ego, because that is what we're talking about. The ego, the lunar bodies, the protoplasmic bodies that we have are related with the moon. And sooner or later, that matter is disintegrated and the energy is free returns into his own source. But according to the path of initiation, we learn how to release that energy from our lunar matter. When we say lunar matter, we talk about the physicality too. Because remember that Yesod is life, Hai in our physicality. And from Yesod, the sexual organs, emerges Malkut. Because all of us, physically speaking, are children of sex. We were nine months in the womb, the sexual organ of our mother, physical mother. And finally we came out. But in which way were we fecundated in the womb of our mother? It was not an immaculate conception. Our physical father spilled the sexual energy as in any animal. Because if you observe animals, they spill the sexual matter. Plants don't do it. They transform that energy. That's why are filled with fruits, flowers, and beautiful. That's why the burning bush is represented by a plant, not by an animal. Unless is Hayot Ha Kadosh, the four holy creatures. But that has to be born within us. Of course, the physicality is lunar. It's the outcome or the process of the diminishing of the light through fornication or what we call the orgasm. So therefore, all of us are condemned to death because death is on the left side, the moon, and life is on the right side, which is the solar light. So if we eat of the fruit which is forbidden, we die. In other words, we are condemned to the lunar path. That lunar path means the subtraction of the light 
through the disintegration of the lunar matter. Simple as that. And any lunar matter is the outcome of fornication. Our physical body is lunar. And what we have inside, Yilith and Nahema, is lunar too. And uh, this clipothic body that we have, physical and psychological, eventually will have to be disintegrated in order to release the light. Because in the universe, the light transforms into matter and the matter into energy. It's a process. And we are in the middle as consciousness, as souls. Now in the process, in the Gnostic process, we learn how to disintegrate Lilith and Nahema within us. In order to liberate those archetypes that the Bible called Israel. Which are all those archetypes that we have within. The Zohar talks very wisely about these archetypes in a very synthetic manner, in synthesis. It is written that when the light of Yehida was going to create the world, Asa and Azael, two angels, they said, came and said, what are you going to create when the human being down there is going to not to be pure? It's going to sin. This Asa and Azael Say this are two angels. We will say it in Gnostic terms, two archetypes that represents the two moons. Asa Yezod and Azael Hod in the left side. Those archetypes that everyone has within. And that becomes identified with the lunar process. They are trapped, in other words in each one of us, in a lunar process. When we disintegrate the lunar aspects that we have in our psyche, Aza and Azael are liberated as archetypes and return to their own source. Of course, this Aza and Azael form a name of an angel. We represent those archetypes named Azazel. Who is this Azazel? It's an angel that when was physically incarnated in the planet Earth, his name was Sholiman or Sol Solomon, the King Solomon. The King Solomon, of course, is written, went down I, his son of sons, he says, I went down into the garden of nuts. And there in the garden of nuts, he learned a lot of wisdom. We can do the same thing. You had to go into the garden of nuts willingly, initiatically. Because sooner or later, we will go down to the Garden of Nuts, but mechanically. Then you will learn anything there. You will be an empty shell. You know what a nut is, right? A nut is that fruit of a tree that is hard in the outside, but inside has that fruit or that seed mm -hmm. that is very nutritious. The squirrels know about that very much. They like it. We have to go along also there, as Solomon did it. But this is a process, you know. Because if you observe the three kings that are named in the Bible, Sheol, David, 
and Solomon, the three of them are a process that we have to take. The first is Sheol, which means hell, in other words. The first king of Israel, Sheol, or Saul, or you call it, means hell. It means that when you are in the process of purification of yourself, you become a king, a malakim, a master. But that is called, and we say in many lectures, a hasnamus. A master that reached the fifth initiation, but still have the lunar aspect inside of him. It's a Sheol. With a lot of ego. Sheol was the one that wanted to kill David. But David was intelligent. He was annihilating Lilith and Nahema, the lunar aspect into, inside of him. First he killed Goliath, who represents that lunar aspect inside of us. And then he still started working against himself. As he explains it in the Psalms, different manners, realistically. David represents that king that purifies Nefesh. In other lectures, I told you that David represents Nefesh, that soul, which is the very lower soul, because the soul are five. Yehida is the first, Haya is the second, and then in the human level, you find Neshama, Ruach, and Nefesh. Nefesh is the lowest, represented by King David. But it's a, a purified Nefesh. As a planet in any part of the universe, which is represented by Malkut, transforms the solar light above, as the Bible explains in the fourth day of Genesis, and let this light be for signs and shine upon the earth, upon Malkut. And uh, those light that we see in the universe shine upon this planet Earth, which is our Malkut, or any Malkut. It's always feeding itself from all the lights of the universe. Transform that and irradiate that in the universe. That's beautiful, right? So David was doing exactly the same thing. David was not a fornicator. Because if you don't know how to transform that light, how is you going to shine? And that's why it is written that the Messiah, which represents Yehida, the soul of Yehida, was going to be the son of David. But ignorances are just taking that literally and thinking the physical master David, because he existed physically. The Bodhisattva, the archangel Azazel, he transformed himself into a solar, solar man, into a solid man, the higher level. But he represents something that is inside of us. And the King David, when that archetype is transforming the solar light in the same way that the sun does it, and then that initiate shines, not like Sheol, the first king, with a lot of ego. He's an anointed one, of course, because he's in the process, but he's an initiate that is not dedicated to the annihilation of the lunar aspect, but just enjoying. Oh, I am a king. I am a master. I reached the fifth initiation. I am doing this. I am doing that. Blah, 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 blah. A lot of ego. A lot of vanity. Like the prostitutes that undress themselves in order to show their power, to show their virtues, to show their spiritual level. That is a Sheol, a master that is so attached to Klippoth. Because I repeat, Sheol means hell. But David is different. He kills Goliath, his own robust ego, 
That Goliath was not outside, was inside of him. And he is pleasing the Lord. And he's shining, shining, shining. Because he wants to show that Yehida, that unity through him. That unity is the Messiah. When you are doing the work, the first unity that appears is the astral body in Hod, the third day. It says, let this Yehida, this unity, become dry land. And we explain that is uh, the astral solar body, the first unity. Or we will say, the first Messiah, son of David. But in the process of initiation, another development of another archetype comes into us, which is called Yosef. And this Yosef is related with Yasad. With the, the transformation of the light of Hod. Because remember that that Yehida in the astral body becomes a unity. That manifests that Messiah in a very lower level, of course. Because there are all the levels, but I'm talking here in the very lower level. That's why the astral body is called the astral mediator. Christus mediator in us. When somebody creates that astral body, Christ has already a unity in him. The very lower level. That's why it is written that the, the body of God, the solar body, is a vehicle of Christ. A vehicle of the sun, S-O-N. But it's not only that necessary. We have to create another unity. Another Yehida has to be concrete and become mental, solar body, which is Netzach. And that becomes the second Messiah, which is the son of Joseph. Because Joseph relates to Yesod and Hod, Kabbalistically speaking. It's a process of Yesod and Hod. And obviously, when that process is done and that is purified, the second Messiah, which is Netzach, appears. The second unity, in other words. Because when you address the Messiah in Kabbalah, you are addressing Yehida. Don't forget about that. That's why Master says, I am the light of the universe. Yehida, yeah, that is Yehiye. The two unities. This Netzah is called Eliyahu, or Elijah, the prophet. So, in the Zohar, it is explained that before Moses appeared, two messiahs had to appear. People that don't have information think, oh, in this physical world will appear first one master, and then another master, two messiahs, and then Moses. But that is ludicrous. The meaning of that is the two solar and mental bodies that belong to the fifth dimension. Two Yehidas, or in other words, two unities, two dry lands that express the light of Yehida in Yetzirah, which is the world of formation. In other words, we have to form, we have to create those things. In order for Shiloh, this is what appears says, in, the, in the book of Genesis. Shiloh. Shiloh. Oh, no. She. How do you write Shiloh? It's S H I L O H. Shiloh. Shiloh. Is uh, Shalom, Shalom, Shalomon, in other words, that archetype that worked with Moses. Because the Zohar says Shiloh and Moses are the same. Moses represents the causal body, Tifereth. Moses cannot appear if we previously don't create the two messiahs inside of us. 
And then Shiloh appears. And that Shiloh is that the causal body, Solomon, that is full with wisdom. Because willingly takes the direct path. See? And enters down into the garden of nuts. Willingly. And he worked with his own nuts. He realizes that we say it in English. I am a nutcase. I had to go down there, destroy all the nut, in order to stop doing a nut, being a nutcase. Because in this day and age, there are many initiates that are being born, but they are nutcases. Still have a, a lot of nut, a lot of clipot, clifa inside. And they are just boasting of this, boasting of that. And who is the one that boasts? It's the clifa, it's the nut. What is inside? It's a pure light. doesn't need to boast of about anything because he is what it is. He's the one that says, I am what I am. And this is it. Light. So you see that? So, <coughs> we find here, of course, In these uh, graphics, a lot of information that you can uh, study. In Genesis 1 5, we find there the, the two similitudes, the two graphics, you see, where it says, And yet he turned into lights, into the firmament of, of uh, heaven, to give light upon the earth, and yet he was so. Yehi is Yehida, remember that. Hmm? So, Yehi was so, you see the planet Earth surrounded by light, like any sun. But the solar force, any sun, any star, of course, is more perfect. And that light is stronger. But in the right, we see how do we have to become also a unity of Yehida. By those lights appearing and transforming into our own uh, into our own psyche, into our own bodies, we have to be born again. Is what Yehida, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, said to Nicodemus. You have to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a form of lights. Remember that in the fourth day of Genesis it is written that God made the stars also. In the last graphic, we wrote... He made the star also. That Yehida made the star also. And we explained. Because every single star, every planet, every comet, every moon is a reflection. It radiates that light. Whether in the cosmic manner or cosmic day or in the cosmic night manner, which is withdrawing. And that is what we call the zodiac. The zodiacal belt, which is in the left graphic, represented by, of course, the Shoshana, the Hebrew letters that hide the mystery of Yetzirah, and the 12 zodiacal signs, which is called Israel, that is everywhere. So here, Kabbalistically speaking, when we talk about Israel, we talk about Israel related with this planet Earth, to the solar system, to the galaxy, to the infinite. Israel is the light that is expressed in the universe. The Matthew Samael explains very clear. Is represents Isis. And Isis is the feminine aspect, the lunar aspect of the light in any part of the universe. Ra, everybody knows that Ra means the solar light. 
in the ancient Egypt that Ra was worshipped because they knew that that Ra was the expression of the solar absolute deins of all. Ra. But that Ra is not only here in this sun that we see in our solar system. All the suns on the infinite space from any galaxy is Ra. And El, well, everybody knows that El is God. Is that God that expresses itself in the universe and that comes from the hay of Elohim? The hay, the ains of, from the ains of emanates El. That's why is L is behind the letter H. And the other Im, Elohim, Yam in Hebrew, is the ocean, the universe, the Akash. That is Elohim. So that's why it is written that Yehida, Yehi, made the stars also. The Zohar says, referring to the countless and innumerable hosts of angelic and ministering spirits existed in and by him who is the light and life of the universe as is written. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning was the fourth day. Right? So, many lectures previously, we talked very clear that every single planet, comet, moon, or sun is a physical vehicle of a consciousness, spirit. Call it angel, call it God. Or gods, if you want. But let us put down here an example on our own physicality. Physically, we are also units. We are dry land. But in the very depth of our consciousness, we have our own inner being. Who is God? Or an angel, if you want. An El. That's why the holy name of God in Chesed is El. Because that El, that Ruach Elohim is inside of us. Individually speaking, particularly. Each one of us has his own El, his own Ruach Elohim. And that is God. He wants to shine through us. What he wants. Now, he reached the level, obviously, of creating a human physical body. In order for our being to reach this level in which we are creating a human physical body, he came from the very bottom. He learned it in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, and finally he is here. He is doing it, of course, through the lunar manner. Because we are still intellectual animals. We are in this knowledge because we want to be a King David. Right? Because King David represents Malkut. Nefesh. That initiate that transformed the light positively. Through initiations. Why do we want to become King David? Because only King David can give birth the Messiah. Remember that the Messiah is called the son of David and also the son of Joseph. The two forces. And then Moses comes internally. And that is a transformation of the light. 
that we do. So, when we read the Gospels, the four Gospels, people ask and believe in Jesus of Nazareth, that is the center, the hero of the Gospels. But they ignore that that Jesus, that Savior, that Messiah, is the son of David and the son of Joseph. That is a process of transformation of alchemy inside of us. It was necessary for the Lord to come physically and, in, and have the life of Jesus of Nazareth in order to show us what to do. Problem in this planet is there are millions of Christians that think that the Master of Aramento came 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, and they wash their hands and say, okay, we are ready. Just believe in him and we go too. Up into heaven. So easy, right? No. It's why the Gospels were written? If it is only uh, believing in him and, and we go to heaven. So easy, right? No. This is not chemical transformation. If you read the Gospels, you saw or you see there, you learn how it's alchemy. alchemy. But you need to have the eyes of an alchemist in order to understand it. The eyes of a Kabbalist in order to understand the message there, as well in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis that we are mentioning here. In the fourth day appears, of course, Eliyahu. Eliyahu represents the mental solar body that is controlled by Hesed, our own particular spirit. Because if you say the tree of life, Hesed is in the right, and Netzah is in the right side of the tree of life. So, it is written that Eliyahu, Elias, was taken into heaven in a chariot of fire. You might think that that prophet was taken at that time. It was wonderful, right? Yes. He was taken in that way. But let us talk about our own particular archetype. We have to go up to heaven. And the throne of God in heaven is called the central nervous system. The central nervous system is called is the brain and the spinal medulla. And the brain is a vehicle of Netzach, the mind. So by... For the mind to go up into heaven, into our head, in other words, and to shine the light of Yetzirah, Atziluth, we have to do the work, the creation of the mental solar body. And this is what is, uh, Elias represents. And that's why in the conjuration or the exorcism of, of the air, we said, Spiritus Dei Fervatus Superaquas. Which in Latin means the spirit that is hovering in the superior waters. And what is superior waters? We explained in the previous lecture. That is me. Because the brain and the central nervous system is floating in the superior waters. The, the, the fluid. The cerebrum, the cerebrum spinal fluid. That is there. This is what is floating, you see. Spiritus de fervatus superaquat. Etic inspiravit in facem omnis spiriculum vitae. And blow in the face of the man the spirit of life. Or the neshama of life, what it says the Bible. Sit Michael dux meus et sabatiel servus meus. Be Michael, my servant, or my, my, my leader. And Sabatiel, my servant. Michael is the king of the sun. He represents the solar light. Sabatiel, the lunar. Are two angels. But you have to control the lunar force in order for Sabatiel be your servant. In the light and by the light. Did you see that exorcism? And talks about the eye. 
the spirits of the air. When we talk about Netzach, we're talking about the air, the mind. We have to control our thoughts. When you said, for instance, may my breath become a word, you know, the breath, the air, so that I will command the spirits of this creature of air. In your head, you have a lot of spirits. In other words, all of us, as long as we have the ego alive in our head, evil thoughts, we are idol worshippers, idolatrous. In order to be an idolatrous, you need to worship your mind, your ego. If you are not laid of spirits of the air that float, that black magicians worship, like Simon the magician that was floating in the air by those spirits, demons of the air, egos, demons. We had to annihilate our own demons inside of us and not to float in the air and to show ourselves or both of ourselves with an intellectual mind. For that, we had to annihilate Lilith and Nahema, the moons that we have in the head. And then the only spirit only God can show and shine in our head. And that's represented by Eliao. Because Eliao means God, E-A-O, yod he vav the holy name of God. You read the story of Eliao, Elijah, you will find a way how to transform your mind, lunar mind, into solar mind. By destroying all of those Baalim that belongs to Klippoth inside of you, inside of us, in order for Elijah taken to heaven. This Elijah taken into heaven means the initiate entering into Nirvana. Remember the transfiguration of Jesus. Elijah was in one side and Moses in the other side and he was in the middle representing Yehida. But there are the two minds because Moses represents the superior manas, superior mind, the causal body that come after Elijah. And that was the transfiguration of Master Jesus. It's the transfiguration of the light. It is written that he shone like the sun. And beside them were these two great prophets that represents two archetypes that we had to develop. So any initiate has to memorize not only the conjuration, I mean the exorcism of water that we were explaining in previous lectures, but also the exorcism of air, which is written in Latin. That help us to control our mind. Sometimes we have a type of thought that bothers us. Or sometimes people that work with witchcraft and black magic sense evil spirits, evil thoughts, in order to control the will of people. We have to know how to defend ourselves with the exorcism of air in order to reject those thoughts and also our thoughts, or sometimes our own particular egos are bothering us. And they mock us. Remember that before creating our own particular Elijah inside of us, we have a tower, a tower of bubbles inside, the tower of Babel, the, the head. And there we are as bubbling things. And sometimes religious things. There are many people that study the Bible or the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita and many other sacred books, and they just bubble, repeat, without knowing what they're saying. We have to meditate in everything that we read and everything that we study in order not to be a tower of Babel. And for that, we need to create the internal bodies. 
Do you have questions? Well, you are talking about the structure of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, nice story. yeah. in Kabbalah you find those 72 uh, pillars, uh, 12 doors, and all that. Uh, uh, of course, it's a lecture already given about that. And you learn this, uh, the symbol of that Tower of Babel. The very bottom 72 is equals 9, which is the ninth sphere, which is sephira, the Sephira Yesod. That you have to control because the Tower of Babel really, if you see, is Yesod, Hod, Netzach. Netzach is the mind, Hod is the emotional body, and Yesod is sex. Each one of us is a Tower of Babel. And if we don't follow the path of chastity, there will be always inside of us confusion of tongues. And we will make a group of confusion of tongues. I have two questions. What, is the, what happens to the, um, the solar bodies at the end of the cosmic days? And then also, um, you said that the Yetida was the, uh, the, the sun behind the sun. So is that, what is that? That's like the spiritual sun, the sun at midnight. The yeah. Yehida is really the, the son of midnight, that we call it initiatically. When you follow the path of initiation, of chastity, you want to know, what are you doing? Are we doing a positive thing or we are wrong? How do we know? And then internally you see the sun in your dreams. It depends where the sun is, is in the east, is in the zenith, or is in the west. And then you understand how the sun, Yehida, the solar light, is guiding you and telling you. If the sun is in the zenith, means triumph, you're doing well. If the sun is in the east, being born, means that you have to work very hard in order to, uh, for the creation of something spiritual in you. If the sun is in the west, means that you have to descend to the garden of nuts. Hmm? Because when the sun is in the west, it sinks into Klippath. So you say, oh, what the Lord is telling me is that I have to go down into my soft consciousness, unconsciousness, infra consciousness, and to study my own nuts hmm? in order to liberate my consciousness. Right? And that's, that's precisely the light of Yehira, which in Christian terms, we call Christ. Because that is the Messiah, in other words. And you receive the guidance of the Messiah in different levels. This light is always mercy, compassion, that has to express in different levels through, through us. And uh, that's your question, right? The, what happened with the solar bodies? that we create at the end of the cosmic day. Those initiates that enter into the Ain Sof at, at the end of the cosmic day, they enter into the Mahapralaya cosmic night, they have to disintegrate the solar bodies. Because you cannot enter with solar bodies into the Ain Sof, only with one atom, atom seed of those solar bodies, you enter there. Then in the next cosmic day, when the, that light is going to manifest again, from that seed, you can create automatically a solar body. That is precisely what the Paramartha Satyas do, and any master that has the internal bodies. Uh, solar bodies only manifest the light during the cosmic day, but not during the cosmic night. Yeah? Are you saying that the Yeah, of course, the, the, the darkness of the Mahapralaya, great cosmic night, it means that all the light 
that we see manifested in the universe withdraws into the unmanifested womb of the universe, which is called the Ein Sof. In there, that light shines. But in the darkness, it's a type of light that is so potent that for our sight is like darkness, but it's a type of light, divine light. Uh, if the light of Yehida from the Ein Sof will manifest universe universally, as it is in the Ein Sof, it will be the universe will be darkness again. Because that light is so powerful that we will see only darkness. That's why it modifies into Haya, into the duality, in order to express in the different levels, but lower levels, the same light, but lower. It's like as I gave you the example in other, in other, in other uh, lectures, that if I have here a lantern light, very strong, and I put it in front of your eyes, you immediately will be dazzled. You won't see light. You will see just darkness because too much light in front of your eyes. Same thing in the universe. If the light of Yehira, which is the pure spiritual divine light, will appear in the universe, we will see darkness. So the pralaya exists right now. The pralaya exists right now in different spots. <coughs> because we, in this planet, we are in a cosmic day and a Maha Mamantara. But other planets, other suns, other systems are in Maha Pralaya. So the light is hidden, right? It's not like there is a Maha Pralaya or cosmic light for the whole entire universe. It's just for spots. Because Maha Pralaya means the death or the transformation of, the, of that matter into abstract light, which is called death. But that process, for us, for instance, physically speaking, when we are old, we go to the grave, we die, and the light is free, is released from our own matter. And that is what we would call a small pralaya in us. The same with the planets, with the suns. You know, well, some people are in the cosmic days, are right now we are alive physically, is what I think. Are we physically talking here? So we are, of course, in a cosmic day, in a small scale. And we have relatives that died. They enter in their own cosmic night at that level, physically speaking. But when we talk about the entering into the universe, into Mahapralaya, the whole planet, into a dark night, that endures exactly the same amount of time that the cosmic day. And in that absolute abstract light exists a type of life that is incomprehensible for us. There's no way that we can understand that. Only by being there. So, you have another question? Yeah. To him, and then there was the five words written on it in the language of light. Are those the five? Those are the five souls. Right? Well, this is something that we had to to inquire. Zama Zama or Zama Ozai. That that's written in in the Pitch of Sophia. It is a process of the light, of course. Zama Zama or Oza Zama or or Zama Ozai. This is what I come to my mind. Yeah. It. Yeah, yeah, it's in the language of the light. You have to meditate in that. Of, uh, even though there are many explanations uh, for other authors of esotericism that said that it says, the light, the light on my vesture. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning of those words. But really, uh, that relates to many dimensions, many forces. It's the light of Yehida. Because the light, the vesture of Master Jesus, He's a Paramartha, Satya. 
is the same light of Yehida in him. And remember that below Yehida, which is Atziluth, we have Bria, the world of creation, Yetzirah, the world of formation, and Asia, the world of the matter in which we are here, three-dimensionally speaking. To be born again means to return the light that we have in this physicality into Yetzirah, into Bria, into Atziluth, and into the Ain Sof. That's the process, the returning of the light, of alchemy, chastity. If you fornicate, there's not a transformation of the light because that light is precisely in higher, in the sexual energy, life. Which, unfortunately, the billions and trillions of people in this earth squander. Not only physically, emotionally, through pornography, mentally, through evil conversations, and etc., etc. Many ways to squander that light in the lunar manner. Do you have questions here? No. Yeah? The what? The book of Kings, chapter 18. Yeah, the, the, well, this is precisely related with, with Elijah. The way in which Elijah disintegrates all of his lunar aspects, which are called Baalim in the Bible. Remember that. That uh, inside of us, we have the Baalim. Baal means Lord in Hebrew. But Lord of the Garden of Nuts. You understand that? Hmm? Because the Lord, as a King David of the light in the superior worlds, is called Adonai. That's why Adonai is the Lord, the one that transforms the solar light in a positive manner. Adonai is an angel, in other words, another, another thing. It means Lord, but individually speaking, that archetype is an angel. And it's a lunar angel. Lunar angel that transforms the solar light in a positive manner. The contrary of Adonai is Baal. In that Baal are many in us, which are the Baalim, which is the ego, represented by the two moons that we have in our psyche. Nama and Lilith, two psychologists. Lilith is a very dark moon, represents the, in the subconscious, unconscious in us. But Nama is a type of moon that reflects the light and that we can see easily through meditation. Defects that we have related with lust, anger, pride, greed, vanity, laziness, fear, etc. That when we sit and meditate, it's too easy to see. In the interaction with our friends, with humanity. But Lilith, only by the disintegrating Nama first. Because then your, your consciousness, which is similar and is synonymous of light, will expand. And then that light will allow you to penetrate into that darkness of your consciousness, which is called Lilith. Where you find type of defects and vices which are very hidden elements that you don't even suspect that you have are within Lilith. Relate to our own past animal level. When still our consciousness was not a human being, but an animal. And remember that this four day of Genesis is related with what in the Bible is called 
Hayot HaKadosh, the four creatures of Ezekiel. The four creatures of Ezekiel, Adam represents the water, the eagle represents the air, the lion represents the fire, and the ox, the bull, represents the earth. Those are the four tadwas that we have been talking in previous lectures, which are vibrations of the light of Akash in different dimensions, which are above in the firmament, which are in us too. Remember that the four tatwas, earth, water, air, and fire, had to be controlled through alchemy in order to, for us to conquer the earth, which is the first sephira in the bottom, which is Malkut. Then we had to overcome the ordeals, the four ordeals of the elements in Yesod, the four ordeals of the elements in Hod, the four ordeals of the elements in Etzach, the four ordeals of the elements in Tifereth, Many initiates, Gnostics, in the beginning think that the four deals of water, fire, earth, and air are just in the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning of any type of degree or initiation. Remember that in the book of Ezekiel is very clear, it's stated, that every creature had four phases. And those four creatures are that grouping of Ezekiel, the human being, the eagle, the lion, and the bull. Those are the four. That is called Hayot, means Haya, the soul of the elements, the life of the elements. If we take Adam, which is the first, the human being, it has four faces, means the three other creatures will shone through him. This is what the other speaker explains. In every single tatwa, you find the other tatwas. Physically speaking, here we have the, the, the four tatwas that we call the four elements. But we enter into Yasad, we find the four tatwas again, but in a very higher level, into the heart as well. And every single sephira contains the tatwas because no sephira can exist without the tatwas. Yeah. Is this how you got the Chalkian personality that you talk about the evolution dialectic? I guess everybody thinks through the intellect that they're entering into the higher the higher light. The Chalkian personality is what, what You're talking about the Chalkian personalities or these personalities of Kali Yuga that think that they enter into heaven just because they belong or they study this, right? Just because they have that in their brain. This is something that is really very uh, worth it to talk about. Because just for the fact that we know Kabbalah, just for the fact that we know all of this and that we are studying it, doesn't mean that we are going to be automatically into another level. It's just the intellect. We have to develop that. It's the, the power, the development of the light. There are many Kabbalists that state that when you study Kabbalah, sooner or later your ego will explode and will liberate Yehida in you. Just like that. Like the Christians that believe that just by believing in the Messiah, Master of Ramento, that came 2,000 years ago, who is precisely the representation of Yehida. Just because he came and he is the light of the world and you believe in him, you will be also automatically saved, purified in heaven, in the future. That's easy. And there's precisely, unfortunately, in this day and age, and the so-called Kalkian personalities that are very abundant in the internet that appear there and talk about these terms 
and they think that they are already there because they read it or because they memorize it or because they believe in this. No. Nobody reaches higher levels if he or she doesn't transform that light in the polarity because higher is the light that manifests Yehida in different levels. And Chaya is Chava. Chava is represented by Yesod and Hod. That's the life, the moon, that the builders rejected. But it has become the head of the corner, the cornerstone, the duality. The Divine Mother, in other words. So, the first light, the sun, represented by Pingala, the right side of the tree of life that comes from the ends of, to Yesod. The other light, which is the moon, is the light that go down into Malkut, and that represents the left side of the tree of life. Is the light that has to return. Is the light that returns mechanically or consciously. Here we have to do it consciously in order to make the solar bodies. If we don't do it, and then eventually that light will return, but through the annihilation of the lunar bodies in Klipot, hell. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,